Guys, welcome back to this week's episode of Unleash Your Inner Greatness. And this week's guest, I'm so excited to introduce him. Jack Canfield is America's number one success coach, movie star as seen in the international seller documentary, The Secret, international keynote speaker, TV talk show guest, and author of the renowned books, Chicken Soup for the Soul and The Success Principle principles and also a humble family man jack is a real testament of how you can create the life of your dreams rubbing shoulders with presidents high profile ceos world athletes and the world's most successful entrepreneurs who look up to jack as a an incredible authentic teacher in his industry of expertise jack's book the success principles is a bible for success and i'm really honored and privileged to welcome welcome you on the show tonight jack welcome to unleash your inner greatness thank you my pleasure we uh we started off the discussion around our love for i guess travel and also talking about sort of where you are in life but i wanted to ground you in a, in a beautiful place to start with as i do with all my guests and just ask what you're most grateful for in your life right now and what was the highlight of this year for you so far? Well, gratitude for my wife, uh, who I've been with uh, for 21 years, and I love her, and we have a great time together. We're totally opposites. I often refer to couples as a balloon in the string. I tend to be the balloon, very practical, very serious, <laughs> just off the wall, spontaneous and authentic and fun, and wants to dance and play and have a good time. And then I'm really grateful for our children, grateful for my staff. I have an incredible... 12 people who work with and for me. Uh, and it's just like, I'm blessed to have such creative people and loyal. I just have like no turnover in my company in like 15 years. And, um, and then I'm grateful for my students. I have students all over the world who are now, I have, a, I have like 3,000 people that are teaching the success principles that are certified trainers in 117 countries. So that's a, a blessing as well. So those are the things I'm most grateful for. As far as highlight of the year, I would say on a personal level, my wife convinced me to take a month off last year and rent a house in Hawaii on the beach, which we did. And uh, you know, my achievement-oriented self was a little, a little concerned about all that, but uh, I managed to convince her I could take one hour a day and work on my books, and the rest of the time we would just play and have fun and be intimate and social and all that. And uh, and then I would say on a professional level, um, finished a. a, a book that's going to be coming out next year called Living the Success Principles. Wow. And it's all stories of people who've either read the success principles or who've taken my Breakthrough to Success seminar and how they radically transformed their lives. Like one yoga teacher went from making 50000 a year to 500000 a year. People that started businesses, people that lost, you know, 60 pounds, people that weren't getting pregnant who got pregnant. And, you know, just all kinds of things based on the, the things that are in the success principle. So just, and I've been working on that book for three years. So that just the fact that it's now complete is like, yay. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's, I mean, I, I've just started, I guess, you know, the, I suppose this podcast really, I wanted to get people who were um, inspirational in my life. So I guess in part the podcast hopefully becomes a book in itself one day. Yes. Yes. I really resonate to the, 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 just the sheer amount of work that goes into writing the book. So Jack, I'm definitely going to buy the book and I'll buy 10 for my friends as well. I promise. <laughs> I'll let you know when it's out. I've got that on, on video now. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, you know, you, you've achieved like, I, I've, I want to go back to actually your point about the staff retention because I read in the success principles, you quoted Patty as someone who's been, very influential in your life and you wanted her by uh mentioning her on really the front of the book yes so i was just wondering like how's patty been influential as part of the business and and your life and you know she you definitely put her on the front of the book so i'm really keen to know how that relationship played part in your overall journey as an entrepreneur. well 30, 30 years ago she responded to an ad and i put in the los angeles times said secretary wanted twenty five thousand a year yeah and uh, she came and became my secretary and then she became my partner you know not my life partner my business partner 
my wife calls her my business wife. And uh, she now is like, you know, she's been the president of self-esteem seminar. She's been the president of the Campfield training group. She's been the president of the chicken soup for the soul uh, enterprises. So all of the different things we've done, she's moved up. She's authored now, I think nine co-authored 19 chicken soup for the soul books. I think 11 of them were New York times bestsellers. Wow. She is a tremendous coach. She does a lot of our mastermind groups online and uh, supporting people throughout the year who've taken our trainings and then want to just keep getting support in terms of implementing everything they learn. And she's an innovator. I mean, I don't think I would have developed our online train the trainer program. If it weren't for Patty, we were in the middle East and we were going from like cutter to Dubai to Bahrain to Kuwait to Iran doing workshops and um, she realized that people we were saying you got, come take our a live train and trainer program and everyone said we can't get visas you know the whole Trump thing we can't get visas and then the whole thing about like, like we can't afford airfares back and forth because then it was a three-week program three times for a week during the course of the year and um, so she said, well, why don't we do this online? And I, my first response was, you can't teach this online. And um, you can't teach people to hug online, you know, whatever. And she said, well, it's better than nothing. Well, we created that, took about two years of editing a live training and then bringing it down to where it's about 40 hours of online course. And that is the main moneymaker of our company right now and the main influence provider because we've got people in Yemen and Rwanda and South Africa and Pakistan who are taking this class and teaching it now to people who would never have access to this. So the internet's allowed that, but she's been constantly, she's the one that said you ought to put all these principles in a book. And so that became the success. Principle. I wrote it, but she was the one who had the idea to do it. So she's often been the inspirational person to come up with the ideas. And uh, occasionally I would say, you're killing me. You're killing me. You come up with the idea, then I have to do all the work. But uh, <laughs> That's a little bit of an overstatement. But anyway, she's been critical. I think you have to have different kinds of people in your company. Most people try to hire people like themselves to avoid conflict and all that. But it's people that are different than you, that have different skills, different um, love languages, different auditory, kinesthetic, visual dominance that actually bring the balance in the company. So it's been really important. That's awesome. And how do you bring forward, you know, I spoke about gratitude at the start. I think gratitude's had a real impact in my life. How is that? How do you bring forward gratitude in your organization? Is there anything that you do to, sort of appreciate your staff or sort of bring gratitude to the forefront of the organization? Is there any tips that you can give fellow entrepreneurs? Well, we always start our staff meetings with two rounds of a, we have this heart we pass around. We call it a heart talk. And the first thing is you have to say what you're grateful for and, and everyone gets a turn and, you know, usually about a minute or so. And then we pass around again, what's the greatest thing you feel like a success that you've had since our last meeting. And, uh, we do gratitude gifts. We honor and acknowledge people whenever they do something well. I have a rule of five, five appreciations a day. I used to have to carry a three by five card with five X's on it that I have to cross off, you know, little boxes that, because I would forget. So at night I'd have to look at it and go, oh, I forgot to, then I'd send emails to people or I'd call someone on my staff and say, hey, great job on that campaign. That was a really good Facebook post you put up today, whatever. And so people are expecting to be appreciated. And I think we've reached a point now where I also teach people that you have to appreciate yourself. I teach an exercise called the mirror exercise, where every night you look in the mirror and um, like I'm looking at my own face on this video right now. And you talk to yourself and you appreciate yourself for three areas of your life. Accomplishments, disciplines you kept, like you did yoga, you meditated, you read five pages, or you know, whatever it was you were committed to do. And then also any um, temptations you didn't succumb to, like staying up too late watching videos or, you know, eating chocolate cake for dessert when you're on a you know, non-sugar diet, whatever it might be. And you end by saying, I love you. And after a while, we become wow. less dependent on other people's appreciation and love because we realize we can source that for ourselves. But obviously, that's a step you have to take where um, you're internalizing the external appreciation. Eventually, you can rely on your own. I've, I've been doing that recently. It, it's not an easy challenge, to be honest, Jack. And this is just mm -hmm. being open and honest with you as a male. Sure. Uh, it feels quite weird when I say I love you to myself in the mirror. Um, yeah. Do you think males struggle with it more than females or do you think it's just the, yes. like, do you think facing off ourselves is one of the most difficult things that we can do? 
I think it's harder for males than for women. Women are much more naturally appreciative. Women are much more in touch with their emotions. They actually have more connectors between the rational part of their brain and the emotional part of their brain. And also, so I mean, there's literally that the, the connecting those uh, neurons, there's less of them for men. And so appreciating ourselves and letting in the appreciation, that's the other part. You have to receive, you know, what you're saying to yourself in the mirror. And uh, you'll see a lot of guys, you know, you say something good, and oh, that's nothing. And instead of, instead of thank you. And in my, in my seminars, I actually have people do an exercise where they compliment each other. And then the th only thing you're allowed to respond is, how perceptive of you to notice? And furthermore, another great thing about me is, and so it's basically teaching them to let it in and to uh, receive it. Another thing is, when someone gives you a compliment, take a deep breath, like, and really breathe it in. When we do this in our seminars, we find that most people, it's the, the, the compliment or appreciation stops about here. And you can breathe it down into your solar plexus, breathe it into your whole body. So you embody the receipt of this, of this um, love and appreciation. But no, I've had men literally say, I love you and turn away. I say, I love you and start laughing. Say, I love you and break out in hives. You know, and one guy said, um, he was doing it and he said, I love you to, the, to his image in the mirror. And they said the mirror spoke back and said, it's about time you said something nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it is more difficult, but it's doable. It's learnable. And yeah. here's the deal. If you do that for 40 days in a row, you start replacing your negative self-talk with positive self-talk. So I used to lose my keys. I would just throw them anywhere. And uh, then I go, you stupid idiot. Where'd you put the keys? Now I just go, I look for the keys. I don't, there's no self-judgment about it anymore. Wow, it's, it's so powerful. Re recently, I did a keynote here in London and I spoke about a pillar of gratitude that I talk about is um, like writing re a regret list, basically a bucket list. Yeah. And I remember I was at Lewis House's uh, seminar in the US and I know Lewis has interviewed you as well. Yeah, he's a great guy. Amazing guy. And at the, at the event, one of the speakers, Ed Milet, said, you know, there's one thing that I've been meaning to do for a long time. And it's actually tell my mother that I love her. So I've got to get around to do it, you know, and, and I, I was in the crowd and I thought, you know what, for 36 years of my life, my mum has been bugging me to tell her, you know, say, just say, I love you, mum. But I couldn't take, I, I just couldn't do it. Like I never had the ability to say, I love you to my mum. So when I got back to London, I made the call and it was the most cathartic, uh, empowering thing that I've probably ever done in my life. Like it just, it was something that needed to be expressed. So I think, you know, hopefully for the people who, who listen in, you know, saying, I love you, not only to yourself, but maybe to someone who you've been meaning to say it to for a long time is really important. It really is important. I was working with a couple once, uh, cause I did couple therapy a long time ago. And this woman said, I want you to tell me you love me to her husband. He said, I told you the day I married you, if it changes, I'll notify you. And that was really sad. And the reality is we love to hear the two basic human needs of people are to feel loved, which means to be included and to, and to feel that people really love you. And the second is to be, feel like you're competent, that you are able to make a difference, to do the things you want to do, to achieve your goals. And so self-esteem is made up of that lovable, capable, and, and also a third thing called significant, you know, that you matter. And when we say, I love you, and we say, I appreciate you, and we say, you made a difference by doing that, I really appreciate that. People light up. We see it. In my seminars, I'll often end the seminar by people sharing acknowledgments. Who wants to share an acknowledgment? I start with yourself. You know, I want to acknowledge myself for losing five pounds over the course of the week. I want to acknowledge myself for stopping smoking. And then who do you want to acknowledge in the group? I want to acknowledge John. And then John stands up and you have to talk to him and say, John, you really sat with me that first night when I was all scared and talked me through my fear. You'd be surprised the level of love that comes out of that. And so it's important that we say it to our parents, to our friends, to our brothers and sisters, our employees. And um, there's actually a great book. If your reader, if your viewers haven't um, read this, it's called The Five Love Languages uh, by Robert Chapman, I think his name. Yeah. Uh, but Gary Chapman. And it talks about five different ways we express love. One of them is words. Another one is, is touch. Another one is quality time. Another one is gifts. Another one is acts of service. And the problem is, if you're a acts of service, you know you're loved when somebody does something for you. 
you don't think you need to say it to a person whose who's love language is words of affirmation. And so we miss each other. And so we need to learn to speak all five languages so that people get that we actually do care about them. What, Jack, what's your primary love language? Mine is nurturing touch followed by words of affirmation. So yep. if we ever meet, give me a hug, high five, you know, fist bump, whatever. <laughs> that matters to me. My wife is quality time. When I go to hug her after about, I don't know, 10 seconds, she goes, that's enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Whereas for me, you could hug me for like, you know, five minutes, I wouldn't care. But if I don't pay attention to her and listen, because quality time to her is listening, yeah, then she doesn't feel loved. It's, it's, um, it's, it's funny. Like it's, um, the information through these podcasts seems to just flow naturally. And if it, like the lessons come just when I need them from the interviewers, the guests that I have on my show and that book come into my life after I lost my marriage, to be honest. Uh -huh. Um, so it was a profound book that I learned about, you know, my partner's love language. And I could actually tell the discrepancy. Like once I learned what her love language was, and I learned what we uh, argued about the most, I understood sort of why we were having disagreements. And I really believe that if you're not talking to each other's love language, you, you do butt heads. Right. So it was a real powerful book. Um, Jack, I want to uh, now look, Chicken Soup for the Soul has sold over half a billion copies. Right. Um, you've been an author of more than 200, an author and editor of more than 200 books. Um, including over 60 New York Times best-selling authors. But for anyone who doesn't know you, would it be okay for you to just tell us a little bit about sort of how you got to where you are today? Uh, maybe from sort of, you know, your hum humble beginnings. Well, I started out, I grew up in West Virginia, which is one of the more impoverished states in America. I was fortunate that I got a scholarship to college. I played football, that's why. And I also graduated third in my class. So the combination of that got me a scholarship. Majored in Chinese history, which has nothing to do with what I do today. But I took an elective class in my senior year in psychology and fell in love with psychology and people and interactions and all that. Became a high school teacher, taught in the inner city of Chicago, and became more interested in why my kids weren't motivated to learn than I was in teaching history. And so what happened for me, I took a class at a place called the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation on achievement motivation. How do you motivate people to achieve more? And W. Clement Stone was a self-made millionaire. He's worth $600 million in today's inflationary standards. He'd be a billionaire at that time. And he had written a book with Napoleon Hill uh, called Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. Napoleon Hill, as you know, wrote Think and Grow Rich. And so I got schooled in all of that information and theory and techniques and I started teaching in my classroom all my kids started succeeding at a much higher level I then started teaching teachers all that work I ended up working for the Stone Foundation for a couple of years went back to graduate school got a master's degree in what's called psychological education how do you educate people about psychological issues started a retreat center where people would come and they would do retreat workshops, uh, everything from Tai Chi to yoga to Gestalt therapy to transactional analysis, um, you know, everything you can think of, we did. And then I wrote a book for educators called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in Your Classroom. That's what started me as a writer. And that book sold 400,000 copies, which is insane in the world of education. Wow. And then I began to get a lot of speaking requests. And pretty soon I was speaking all over the world in terms for teachers teaching self-esteem. But then the recession hit in 1993 and all the education money dried up. So we had to start doing public seminars for adults. And um, that led into all the work I now do about success, which then led into the Chicken Soup for the Soul books in 1993. I did, I, it's funny, everyone was saying, all those stories you tell, they're really inspiring. Are they in a book anywhere? And I go, no. And then one day I'm coming home on a plane that kind of hit me like, bam, put those stories in a book. <laughs> so I made a, com a commitment. I would write two stories a week. Then at the end of the year, I'd have a book. And so that's what I did. Then I met Mark Victor Hansen. I think I was about 70 stories into it. And he said, I got 30 more stories. We should have a hundred. I'll co-author with you. And I went, okay, he's a really great marketer. I'm a really good editor. The combination was great. And, uh, as you probably heard, that book was rejected by 144 publishers. And uh, we just kept going and going and going. And eventually, this publisher down in Florida said, we'll publish it. And uh, we, we said, OK. We said, how many copies do you think we'll sell? He said, 20,000 copies. And we said, that's not our vision. 
He said, what's your mission? And I said, we want to sell 150,000 by Christmas because the book was going to come out in July and a million and a half in a year and a half. And he laughed at us. He just thought we were crazy. He said, you guys are crazy. I said, no, we're entrepreneurs. We're, we're visionaries. We can do this. We sold 1.3 million in a year and a half. He stopped laughing. He bought a jet for himself. And, um, and then he <laughs> said, we should do more of these. That's what started the series. And here we are over 250 books later. Wow. I was, I was thinking on the way back from work tonight, of all the stories that you've um, come across in terms of what's inspired you, what's the one that comes out the most? What's the one that you speak about the most that's inspired you the most? Well, that's like asking me, if you could only keep one organ in your body, which would it be? <laughs> you know, like, there's so many. Um, you know, we've edited over 20,000 stories. Uh, but I would say a couple, one is about a guy named Roger Crawford. He was born with only one leg and he only had a finger and a thumb on each of his hands. And, uh, but he believed in himself and he ended up uh, becoming a college tennis star. He's a professional tennis teacher and he has a prosthetic leg. Uh, he believed he could do anything he wanted. And he, his racket with one finger, he puts that through a little groove at the head. You've seen these rackets that come down and then they have a little bit of a, a V. He puts his finger in there, holds the, the, the racket here. And he went on. The only person he ever lost to in his entire career was John McEnroe. Wow. And so basically, very amazing story. Another story uh, is about a kid who I met in a, in a hotel in Malaysia. And he wanted to be a magician. And he sat in a hotel lobby for four hours, hoping I was going to check into that hotel. Came up to me when I did check into the hotel, because it was closest to the venue where I was going to be speaking. Said, can I show you a few magic tricks? And I said, sure, I love magic. Came up to my room, blew me away. Uh, I said, come to my seminar tomorrow. And he did. And as a result of that, he uh, learned about mastermind groups. And he approached a billionaire in Malaysia and said, I want to be in a mastermind group. That kid's 19. And the guy said, why should I do that? He said, well, I'll bet three of my friends who are 19. You get three of your friends who are billionaires. We'll bring the youthful perspective. You bring the wisdom. And I think we could do better together. Well, the billionaire had never heard of a mastermind group. So he said, why not? And they did it. And after a year, he took, he loved this kid so much. He paid for him to study for a year and a half in Vegas with all the great magicians. And he went back to Malaysia, became uh, like the Guinness book of world records. They have a, what they call the book of records in Malaysia, got into that. And uh, this guy just two years ago said, I'm building a hotel, a, a restaurant at the top of the um, uh, revolving. It's a revolving restaurant top of the uh, building, the Patronus building, tallest building in Malaysia. I want you to be my partner. So the kid's now in his mid twenties and he's a oh. partner with this billionaire in a, you know, multi-million dollar restaurant, all because he was willing to take a risk and ask for what he wanted. So one of the principles I teach is ask, 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 ask. Most people are afraid of rejection, so they don't ask. Yep. And as I say, if you ask and you get a no, you already had a no, it didn't get worse. So by all means ask. So that's one of my favorite stories. Oh, that's unreal. It's so inspiring. Um, uh, with um, with the people who do inspire you, Jack, what do you think one of the key fundamental principles that allows them to, you know, over over and beyond uh, overcoming rejection? Can you see a certain quality in someone who's really going to make it? You know, yeah, I, I I refer to it as charisma and Buckminster Fuller, who you know was a genius, uh, compared to Einstein by many people said once, there's no such thing as uh, a genius. Some people are just damaged less. And so what I mean by that is charisma. You know, Bill Clinton had charisma. Why was that? Because he just was fully who he was. And he got in trouble for part of that, as we know, with Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, you see certain people who are just so enthusiastically passionate about what they care about, what they're into. They haven't been uh, dulled by the conditioning from their parents, by the school, by the culture, by their religion, uh, by the woundedness they might have had from rejections and trauma and childhood. And so that's all healable. We can, we can release those negative emotions and get back into a loving space. Most of the people that are super successful, I, I just wrote a forward for two books. One's called The Billionaire Secret. 
and the other one's called Homeless to Billionaire. And one, the Raphael Badziag, who lives in Poland, wrote the first one, and he interviewed 21 billionaires. And what we found is they, it, but in their teenage years, they were passionate about something, and they just never gave it up. And the, all, all but I think one or two of them were, were born into pretty severe poverty, and, but they had the imagination and the belief that they could get out of there. So it's this belief and self-confidence in yourself. It's the willingness to work hard. Almost every one of these billionaires gets up around 4.30 in the morning. They all but one exercised, all but two meditated. Uh, they all read voraciously. Uh, they surround themselves with positive people. And they're willing to take risks, you know, calculated risks, not stupid risks. But they're willing to put it on the line. And I think that's a big thing. And then disciplined behavior. They all have disciplines they do. And um, most of them go to bed at a reasonable hour. They eat healthy. So all the things that you would normally teach someone to be successful, these people do. And they, whether they would call it the law of attraction or call it the secret, almost every one of them lives this idea of visualizing it, believing it, acting as if. Uh, there's one book, Homeless a Billionaire, by uh, a guy named uh, uh, Andres uh, Pierce. He is from Sweden, moves to Thailand, uh, no money at all when he gets there, goes to Phuket because it's warm, he doesn't like the cold of Sweden, eventually is homeless on the beach. And someone sends him a copy of The Secret and he reads it and he says, this is all BS, I don't believe in this law of attraction stuff, but I got nothing better to do, I'm sitting here on the beach, I'm unemployed. So he started visualizing a cup of coffee, which he hadn't had in a month because he couldn't afford it. And he would said, I closed my eyes, I felt the heat of it, I smelled it, I felt the warmth of it going down my throat, the energy of the caffeine going out of my bloodstream. And he did that for about five minutes. The next day, he's asleep on his, his beach towel, basically. The guy shakes him and says, I've been watching for you for a few days. I own the uh, ski mobile thing over there. And I thought I'd buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> whoa, this is ridiculous. And then, the, then he said, well, I'm going to see if this will work again. So now he visualizes a full meal because he's been eating noodles for 25 cents a day. That's all he can afford. And he visualizes a steak and potatoes and green beans and a salad and dessert and coffee and all that. About three days later, he's walking down a beach and someone says, are you from Sweden? Did you go to such such high school? I think we were in high school together. Let me buy you lunch. This kept going. He kept, and then he started visualizing having a job. A week later, he had a job. Then he started visualizing moving up in the company. Well, 15 years later, he's worth $3 billion. He's 35 years old. And he started when he was 19 on the beach being homeless. And all of the same principles of gratitude, appreciation, visualization, affirmations, being clear about your goals, all that stuff. And so these are the things I see over and over. And there's a sparkle in the eye of people. There's an energy about them. It's just like, for, you know, not frenetic, but energetic and vibrating. And I, I, I meet someone that's 15 years old and I can tell you're going to be a success. Amazing. How, how important is overall fear? How does fear play a part of the entrepreneurial journey? I mean, you know, fear of success, fear of failure, fear of uh, judgment. How have you used fear in your journey to elevate your consciousness and success? Well, I think when fear shows up, what we have to do is ask ourselves why. In other words, all fear all fear with the exception of loud noises and falling backwards is self-created by imagining bad things in the future that haven't happened yet. That's why you get that acronym of future experiences appearing real or fantasized experiences of appearing real. And so your body cannot tell the difference between a real event and an imagined event. If I had the time, I'd have you and your viewers close their eyes and imagine they were standing on the top of the tallest building in the world and then walk to the edge of the terrace and look down. And without, there's no railing at the edge. Everyone I've ever done that with, their body tightens up, their breathing gets shallower, their hands get sweaty. And so your body can't tell the difference between a real event and imagine event. Okay. So what we have to do is either stop imagining the bad stuff, which is pretty hard to do, although Buddhists do that by meditating and coming into the present moment. But more the Western model is to replace the negative image with the positive image. I'm on a plane. I'm flying to Orlando, I'm in LAX, about to take off, and this woman next to me, white knuckles, breathing hard, scared as hell. And I said, uh, you seem to be scared. She said, yeah. I said, well, I'm a psychologist, I can help you with that. She said, well, how's that? I said, close your eyes, tell me what you're imagining. She says, well, I'm imagining the plane crashing at the end of the runway. I said, well, that'll do it. I said, so <laughs> why are you going to Orlando? She said, I'm going to, to go to Disney World. 
Why? I'm going to see my grandchild. You ever been there before? Yes. What's your favorite ride? It's a small world. So I said, close, keep your eyes closed and imagine you're in the gondola and it's a small world and your grandson's there, you're holding hands. And I actually started to sing the It's a Small World song because I know it because I have lots of children I took there. You know, it's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. <laughs> And all of a sudden, her breathing stopped, the, her skin stops being so red, her hands relax, and, you know, she's, she's now happy because she's visualizing the outcome she wants, not the outcome that she doesn't want. So that's, the, that's a big breakthrough for most people. And now we have something called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, where you can literally tap on nine acupuncture points on your face and in your shoulders and under your arm while you visualize the thing you're afraid of. And after about five to nine, maybe 10 repetitions of that, while you're thinking about the thing you're afraid to do or afraid of, the fear disappears. I mean, it literally disappears. And so we now have the technology in five minutes or less to disappear any fear. I've gotten people on airplanes that were afraid and the kayaks that were afraid, people that would never take an airplane, come to my seminar by train, they fly home. And so uh, literally, I have a book called Tapping Into Ultimate Success. People can get that. But there's a DVD in the back that shows you how to do it. Or you can just go online. There's tons of um, people teaching tapping on YouTube. Do you think tapping is the, is the most... Uh is the most successful or proven thing that you've found to, to help? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, there's NLP stuff that Tony Robbins used to teach and demonstrate, you know, big people are afraid of heights and get them up on the ladder and do all that. It takes longer. I, I think that tapping, most people think tapping so simple, they don't even try it. Um, but I've worked with people with every fear you can possibly imagine, heights, agoraphobia, fear of being enclosed in spaces, um, take them out, put them in an elevator five minutes later and they're fine. They never took an elevator before in their life. Um, but you have to be willing to do it and you have to know how to do it, which is you can learn it in five minutes or less by watching a video or reading a book about it. Um, and it works. The guy who invented it, has done research, is 99.4%. So maybe 0.6% of people doesn't work. Wow. And then you can do other things. So it's, it's foolproof. And now we know you can disappear limiting beliefs. You can disappear uh, physical pain in your body. Uh, it's, all, it's all energy. And what happens with fear is the energy goes to the back of your brain in the amygdala. And your rational thought occurs in your forebrain. And so your forebrain has been hijacked, your prefrontal cortex has been hijacked by the amygdala so when you tap it brings the energy back here it breaks down the neural pathways it's kind of have you ever seen those things where they put all the dominoes in a row on a floor in a gymnasium and there's like five thousand dominoes and then they hit one and they all go they're fun to watch but the fact is if you take three dominoes out the domino that hits that space goes blip and it stops working and so what we were doing, we we're removing those dominoes in the neural pathways of the brain. And uh, so the stimulus called C spider doesn't turn into, ah, it's all of a sudden C spider. Oh, we'll put the um, book, your book in the show notes as well, Jack, because I think yeah, that's a really important. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. I actually haven't done much of that work, but I'm keen to look into that after the show as well. Good. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, I know for myself, like, and I think part of my journey as well is just to unravel uh, the learnings from past generations and just try and help future generations to improve, you know, their lives and become better people for for themselves. You know, the best right. for themselves. Um, one thing that's, I suppose, I've struggled with myself, and I see it around as well, is like a scarcity mindset. Um, an example was, you know, growing up, used to have a, a shower within 30 seconds or a minute, my mom would be banging on the door because she was fearful that we couldn't afford the, like to pay the bills for the hot water right. and, and perhaps even like scarcity of maybe in a business, if you reach a certain level of income, you, you then jeopardize that because you don't feel worthy of it. I was just wondering, have you done anything practical in, in your uh, business or personal life to help you, uh, you know, maybe find the root cause of scarcity or, you know, just some practical advice for the listeners to become more abundant in thinking. Sure. Well, the truth is the, the universe is infinite. You know, uh, one of my friends says you can go to the ocean with a teacup, you can go to the ocean with a gallon jar, you can go to the ocean with a tanker, or you can go to the ocean with a pipe, like a pipeline. You know, you're never going to run out of water. And with all the global warming that's happening, we're getting even more water in the ocean, you know, and, and the universe is like an ocean, you know, uh, money is just a concept. It's a, it's a, it's a representation of energy. 
and there's a lot of ways you can move things through barter, through trade, through consciousness, etc. And all energy follows thought. You know, so uh, I can literally teach people to grow their hands longer in about 25 seconds. And so the reality is energy follows thought. And so the universe is abundant. I mean, there, there's billions of trees and billions of molecules and billions of dollars. There, there's no end. We, we're not distributing the money as well as we could. You know, right now it's getting locked up at the top. But I can give you 150 stories because they're in my books, of people who were totally impoverished, like homeless to billionaire, et cetera, uh, who were able to become abundant. Why? Because they believed it was possible. If you look around, you know, one of my mentors, W. Clement Stone, as I mentioned earlier, told me to go down to the, the, the stock exchange in Chicago, and as the billionaires were coming out, getting into their limousines, to thank them for being a model of what was possible. Now, that was oh, weird. Wow. Right? Very awkward and uncomfortable. But what I began to see was all these people started out just like me. Most of them were not born like Donald Trump with their father giving them $400 million. So the reality is there's, there's plenty of money. One of my favorite quotes was uh, from a, a guru who wanted to buy a, um, a college. He was an Indian guru and he wanted to buy this college that was for sale in Iowa. And all of his students said, where's the money going to come from? And his answer was, well, from wherever it is now. And so, you know, the fact is, there's no end to how much service you can provide. What you have to do is figure out, how can I serve people in such a way that they'll be willing to give me money? I just uh, wrote a story about a young boy uh, who, by the time he was 11, was a millionaire. And his parents were not rich. In fact, they discouraged him to start a business. But at six years old, he started, he bought some chickens with his allowance money. He then started growing eggs. I mean, you know, having the chickens do eggs. He started selling the eggs. He took that money and he bought a lawnmower. He started mowing lawns for $10 an hour. He took that money, bought a second, a third, and a fourth, and a fifth lawnmower, hired other kids at $5 an hour, charged the clients $10 an hour, took the money he was making from that and bought a power washer so he could wash people's driveways. Then he took that money and started investing in real estate. By the time I met him at 11, he had a million dollars worth of real estate. So, you know, there's a guy in Ireland I interviewed. He sold apples uh, for a penny. He, he wrote a book called Penny Apples. And he's now a multimillionaire as one of the largest car dealerships in Dublin. And so it's a matter of just finding a way. Brian Tracy says, if you want to make more money, find out a way to provide more service for more people. And so I'm constantly asking, how can I serve the people I have better? What new products, services, and workshops can I do? And then also, how do I find more people to be of service to? And so now we've got like 1.3 million people on our Facebook page, you know, about 700,000 people in our, you know, Pinterest and all that, you know, tweets and so forth. So the point is it didn't happen overnight, but it happened one story at a time, one book at a time, you know, et cetera, until eventually you can be very, very wealthy. And now with the internet, you've got kids that are 15, 20 years old that are, that are internet millionaires. And so the, the opportunity now is insane. So all around us is the example of people that are doing well, and we just have to decide to be one of them. Mark Victor Hansen, my co-author, asked the Dalai Lama, he said, what's the best thing we can do for poor people? He said, don't be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, model for people what's possible, mm. and then share your ideas and your wisdom with them. And that's what I've, been, that's what I've devoted my life to. That is brilliant. I, lo I love that quote. Don't be one of them. That's awesome. Um, with uh, you, men you mentioned um, uh, like there was a, a a part that you mentioned as well about you know on on the entrepreneurial journey to success. There's like making peace with your past. You briefly just touched on it, and it was just about when you were talking about the tapping in fear and um, you know helping to overcome trauma, etc. One thing that I've picked up in my conversations lately with podcast guests is just how important it is to actually heal inner wounds. And I know that in your book, you also made reference to making peace with your past. Yes. No, it's, it's, yeah, make, you know, heal the past so you can embrace the future. And I think, you know, and I'm just writing a forward to a book right now written by a woman in New Zealand, similar message. That what happens the, for most of us, usually between the age of three and eight, we have one or more traumatic experiences or painful experiences. They don't all have to be traumatic, but we're ignored. 
you know, we're, we're rejected. Uh, maybe our father dies when we're six or our parents divorce or we have a major accident or we're made fun of for the way we talk, look, our interests, maybe we're gay, you know, whatever it is, people have these experiences where they experience deep emotional pain. Yeah. And then in that moment, we make a decision because we don't ever want to experience that again. We make, an, we make a decision. You know, I'll never share my feelings. I'll never ask for what I want. I'll never talk about sex. I'll never try to be a burden. I'll try to be perfect for my parents. You know, I won't upset anybody, whatever it is. And, and then what happens, we forget we made that because it's so long ago. And because it's associated with a deep emotional experience, if you want to lock in a, a memory, just have a deep emotional experience. Everybody knows where they were when 9-11 happened. Everyone in America knows where they were when Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy was killed. And so the reality is there's a deep emotional impact and bam, we remember it. And so that's what happened as children. So we have to go back and there's a number of techniques you can use to do it. Go back to that early experience, realize that the experience was not personal. Our parents didn't set out to destroy us. They were just uneducated, they were scared, you know, whatever. Uh, and then, so we realized it wasn't personal to us. It would have happened to anybody. And then we have to give counsel from our wise adult self to our child self. You know, maybe there's a lesson here. Maybe you develop strength because of it. You develop courage. You develop strength, you know, because you decide you had to do it alone, whatever it is. What's a new decision you can make that would be more helpful and more empowering than I'll never show my feelings or I'll never ask for anything or I'll, you know, whatever it might be. And then go into the future and ask your 95 wise self that's just in your imagination, but you can access your wisdom that way. What advice would you give to the adult sitting here? I'm writing a book on that right now with a, a psychologist called Unstuck, the Heart Freedom Method. How do you free your heart? And what happens is you can be doing a lot of the manifestation work that we all teach, but if your vibration's not high, meaning you're not in a space of love and joy and peace and harmony and you've forgiven people and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's like you've got static on the line. You know, you've done it on a phone when, you know, you don't every third word kind of thing. And so what happens is we have to clear the static out and then your vibration is higher. You have more, it's kind of like if I'm on a 50,000 watt radio station, as opposed to a 20,000 watt radio station, the 50,000 has wider broadcast. So you're going to be more charismatic. People are going to be attracted to you. And anything you send out as a thought is going to have more wave to it so that it reaches further and with more impact and people are going to respond to you. And the universe will respond to you and your subconscious will be more uh, impactful in terms of coming up with solutions. So it's absolutely critical. It's so important. I think it's one of the most important things, Jack. Um, so I really thank you so much for imparting all those tips. I love the visualizing to your 95 year old self and asking for the wisdom. I, I'm yeah. really taking a lot about the visualization part. Um, and it's funny when you sort of get me into that place and you say, you know, imagine yourself in this situation, you really take me there. Like it's really powerful. So yeah. yeah. But, you know, phenomenal. I, one of the things W. Clever Stone taught me is he said, you know, you have access to all consciousness in the universe. If you simply use your brain, your mind to go there. And so you can literally create a board of advisors. So on my board of advisors, I have Henry Ford. I have Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, you know, uh, the guy from South Africa, Mandela. I have some mud business people, Tony Robbins, all these people. So I can close my eyes and go inside, visualize all these people, ask them for advice, and then listen to it. And it may not be from them but it's from a higher source of energy and it may be actually be from them. Some people think you're actually accessing their consciousness and, uh, but we're not teaching that in the schools. So we have to go to workshops and listen to podcasts to learn how to do that. But there is nothing that's not available to everybody if they just learn. So that's why they should be listening to you every week and watching YouTube videos, Ted talks, reading books like mine and Brian Tracy's and yours and you know, all that. That's really, we have to be in a constant learning. You know, I love this phrase, can I, constant and never ending improvement. You know, uh, someone once said, when you're busy learning, you're busy dying. So I believe that. Uh, Jack, is there anything that you find yourself visualizing at the moment and asking your 95 year old self for guidance on? Yeah, all the time. I mean, recently, if I'm about to make a decision, like I just got invited to teach at a, it's called the president's uh, conference. 
uh, it's put on by some guys in England. It's going to be in Copenhagen next year. And it'll be 3,000 CEOs there. And they don't they pay expenses, but no fee. And I usually like to get a fee for speaking. So I went inside and I asked my board of advisors, is this a good thing for me to do? Because it's going to cost me four days of my life to go there and do that by yeah. the time I travel and deal with jet lag and come home and everything. And um, I got an overwhelming yes. So it, my ego didn't want to go. It's like, oh, God, all the travel and no money in it and all that. And then they were going, you're crazy, Cam. <laughs> all these people have companies. They can you know, hire your trainers for train the, their, their trainers, their HR directors and so forth and so on. And they gave me a lot of good advice. Uh, losing weight. Uh, I discovered that one of the reasons I was not losing weight, I asked my board of advisors and they said, you were skinny as a child. And so you uh, have this subconscious need to throw your weight around and, and not be, you know, the skinny kid. And so you're powerful now. You have words, you have money, you have all kinds of power. You don't need to have 30 extra pounds. So I've lost six pounds in the last several weeks, thanks to my internal board of fitness advisors. That's awesome. <laughs> And I hope everyone after this call creates their board of advisors. That, that would be a really great thing. How many people do you, do you think they should have on that board? Uh, whoever you want. So, yeah. you know, you might want to have someone that's a, a health guru, someone that's a financial guru, uh, someone that's a wise being like the Dalai Lama or, you know, Abraham Lincoln or, uh, you know, get up Christ or Muhammad or, you know, whatever, whoever you think of as, it could be your grandfather. You know, uh, but the idea is that we, we're accessing a vibrational field that is represented by these symbolic beings. Yeah. And, and Jack, while we're talking about energy and spirituality, how do you elevate your energy, at, you know, in this day and age, um, you know, to sustain yourself and further develop? And, sure. you know, and how do you bring spirituality in your day to day practice now? Well, I'm 75 and I, I, my doctor tells me my biological age is about 57 and I want to live to be over 100. And so for me, I meditate every day for 20 minutes. Okay. I visualize my goals for the last two or three minutes of that 20 minute meditation. I then read for at least a half hour something spiritual or positive or uplifting. And then I exercise for a minimum of 20 minutes. It usually extends into 30 or 40. So I call that the hour of power. And um, these are the things that I've noticed successful people in all cultures do. I also eat really healthy, organic food, very limited amount of meats, uh, high vegetable fruit diet, you know, complex carbs, don't eat a lot of sugar. I drink a little bit of wine, but not much. I exercise. I uh, forgiven everybody. I uh, can't think of anyone I've not forgiven. If it, if it comes up, I do it. Wow. Um, and I do EFT tapping, not every day, but anytime I get upset, I will take myself through that. Okay. to release that and i sleep uh, seven hours a night which seems to be what my body needs and um and, and I, I i take retreats I, i'm going down to rhythmia which is a, a place in costa rica i don't know if you've heard of it uh it's a retreat center where they actually do plant medicine ayahuasca yeah and i'm going down there for for a week i'll be engaging in that i'm taking a group with me wow uh, fellow people yeah and so i this will be my third time of doing that not not at rhythmia but uh, i i believe that i believe that plant medicine uh we now have so much research that you can we talked about healing the childhood stuff uh radical in one week people are letting go of like things that might take you know years of therapy or years of uh, you know doing other kinds of work uh, i'm really really intrigued by it and i think that uh I think it's way for a lot of people that are just unwilling to spend a lot of time working on themselves. It's a quick way to, uh, to get to the other side. I'm fascinated. You mentioned it, Jack. I'm absolutely gobsmacked because I, I, I did it um, about two months ago uh -huh. and I agree, you know, I let go of so much that I had to let go. You know, right. I, I learned so many things through it. It, I suppose it didn't show me anything that I didn't already know, but it was just a learning of forgiveness for myself just to come back to that place of love. It's so powerful. I, I'm, uh, I'm really honored that you, that you share the, the gift of ayahuasca. I think it's a very powerful plant. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people doing it, not that many people talking about it, but I think it's changing because I think a lot of people have been afraid of judgment, yeah. afraid of 
here, but uh, you know, down at Rhythmia, they've had uh, U.S. congressmen, CEOs of companies. My publisher went there, um, you know, for the chicken soup books. Uh, I know, you know, I think Richard Branson sent like 20 of his people down there, you know, wow. people to his company. So, okay. uh, you know, I think, again, unfortunately, what happens is the greatest breakthroughs first are taken advantage of by the very wealthy and then usually by the professional athletes. And then eventually it gets down to the masses. But I think this is something that we're going to see more and more um, coming into the mainstream. Yeah. It's a really deep, profound experience. And I think for a lot of people, it's quite difficult to talk about. I know I did it, I did it before I started a new uh, sort of job here in London. And it was uh, a very difficult transition <laughs> first couple of weeks. It was just, it's just you know, to get, to get grounded again, um, mm-hmm. it's, to integrate all those learnings takes a while, but incredibly profound. So... Well, someone someone once said, I think it was Ramdas said, you know, you have these what I call mountaintop experiences. Sometimes they happen in meditation. Sometimes they happen with the support of plant medicine. But what happens is we see the mountaintop, we come back to reality, and now we still have to climb the mountain to create that mountaintop in our everyday life. But at least we know it's there, yes. and at least we know what the, the the principles are of forgiveness, of love, of making relationships more important than money. You know, things like that. And then um, life works a lot better. Yep, and it's daily work. So, um, all right, Jack. I, I was gonna. I've I've written down a, a question which is important to me, and it's actually just following on from the ayahuasca. You've mm-hmm. written a book on this, so you should. Uh, you know, you've got some con- context around it. But I think bad habits hold us back a lot. Um, you know, perhaps addictions as well. Yeah. Be like uh, you know, alcohol or biting your nails or pornography or whatever it is. How do we finally let go of disempowering habits? Well, I've written two books. One's called The Power of Focus, which has to do with habits. And the other is called The 30-Day Sobriety Solution, which focuses particularly on addictions. Yeah. And basically what happens is we're using our addictions to numb out the pain that we feel in our life. So whether it's pornography, whether it's just buying stuff, You know, I just watched the life story of Elton John and, you know, Elton John was addicted to drugs and alcohol and shopping. And at the end of the movie, he says, I'm still addicted to shopping, but (laughs) Elton can afford it. Elton's worth hundreds of millions of pounds. But the the general idea is when we're doing these addictive behaviors, whatever they might be, gambling could be another one, you know, uh, whatever, but usually drugs and alcohol and foods, another one. What happens is when we eat, when we, when we, we, we're numbing out our pain. And so what ultimately has to happen is we have to be willing to feel that pain, but know that we have the tools to actually process it out, to relieve it, to complete it. You know, you look at most AA meetings in America and they're people from lower income families, not all, but many, or people that are often movie stars, but had no childhood because they were a a talent, very young, like Michael Jackson, whatever. And so they have the pain of not experiencing that joy of of being a, a child. And so if we know through therapy, through tapping, through ayahuasca, through other kinds of things that we can release that pain, then we don't have to have the fear. You tell someone it's an alcoholic that you need to stop drinking and they're saying, what? And keep feeling all that pain? I don't think so. And so that's why rehab, when it's done well, you learn how to process that pain. You go through the therapy you need to go through. You release the resentment, the guilt, the shame. You go into forgiveness. You learn how to self-nurture yourself. You learn how to self-affirm yourself. So in my 30-day sobriety journey book, you know what, what I wanted to do was take people. It says you, know, you can do this in the privacy of your own home for people who don't want to go to rehab or AA meetings. And it takes them through the process of literally of addressing the pain, releasing the pain, for finding other fulfilling things to do. Because if you're used to drinking from five o'clock to six o'clock every day or from five till midnight, you know, your, your cocktail hour or all night, what do you do instead that's going to make you feel good? Well, there's listening to music, there's dancing, there's playing the guitar, there's making love, there's doing yoga, there's getting massage, there's walking in nature, there's swimming. There's lots of things. Most people have never considered those. They haven't added them into their life. They don't have coaches or guides that can teach them to do that. So in the 30-day sobriety solution, we walk people through 30 lessons 
Most people are not in touch with their life purpose. One of the reasons we drink is we feel we have no purpose. And so we're not getting fulfilled. So what is your purpose? How can you start to create a vision and goals to help you fulfill that purpose? So it's literally like having a 30 day um, program. We ask you to just put in an hour a day to learn how to live the fulfilling life that you don't need to have alcohol or drugs or pornography or you know whatever food to, to do that. And also we have tapping in there. Every time you have the desire to drink, you can literally tap on that desire and disappear the desire. So there's lots of tools that are available that most people are just not aware of, but they are now because they're in the book. Awesome. And I'm going to link that in the show notes as well. Good. Um, thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple of rapid fire questions and then my last question. Sure. Um, I'm so grateful for the discussion and all the wisdom you've shared to date. Um, it's so transformational. My first uh, rapid fire question is how do we live a happier life jack i think there's a lot of things one is i mentioned forgive everybody number two find 20 things you love to do just make a list 20 things i love to listen to elton john music i love to dance i love to watch this tv show i love to go shopping whatever it is and then make sure you do at least one of those things every day build it into your schedule uh, number two, forgive everybody that you've ever been upset with. Number three, take more risks, have more fun. Uh, I would recommend you watch some humor. I, I listen to only comedy stations on my radio, XM radio, when I drive. And so my wife and I watch uh, comedy specials, etc. So laugh more. But more importantly than everything, make sure you have relationships with people you love. Get out of the ones that, where you feel like you're not being loved or you're being put down. There's, you don't have time for that. And then lastly, find a way to serve. If you can do something that makes a difference in the lives of other people every day, even if it's just a little bit, you know, make someone smile, volunteer a couple hours a month to something, you're going to be much happier. Thank you. Um, next one is, how do we live a more purposeful life? Well, you have to find out what is your purpose. And so uh, because this is a rapid fire, I would say uh, joy is your guidance system. In other words, if you're not experiencing joy the majority of the time, I'm not saying 24 hours a day, changing the diaper, you know, folding the laundry, maybe not. But in your work, in your relationships, you should be feeling joy. Joy is like a GPS system is saying on course, on course, on course. And if you're not feeling joy, it's going off course, off course, off course. So start doing the things that you like to do that make you light up. Most of us are asking, what does the world need? That's how I'm going to make a living. I say, ask yourself, what lights you up? And if you do that, you'll find a way to make a living at that. Perfect. And how do we live a more regret-free life, Jack? Stop not doing the things you really want to do. In other words, uh, the only thing we regret, very few people regret what they've done when they're on their deathbed. They regret the things they didn't do. Now, obviously, you don't want to be stupid and go around and you know, tell everyone they're an idiot and then regret the relationships you've created. But in general, when you talk to people on their deathbeds and as they're older, they regret not having taken that year off and traveled around the world. They regret not having taken their grandson to France for the summer, you know, whatever it is. So when you have these ideas, I would like to do that. I would like to do that. I keep a file called Someday Maybe. And then I take things out of that file and I do them and make a bucket list. What are a hundred things you want to do before you die? You know, I did that a number of years ago when I was 47. I'm 75 now. I've done 84 things of my 101 things I wrote down. And every year I make sure I do one or two more. Wow. Is, is there any on that list that you feel like, is there any that are so, it, like, it's, so it's so big, you're dreaming so big that perhaps you may, may not achieve it? Is there any on that list? Well, I have a goal to train a million trainers to do my work by the year 2030. Okay. Now, I may not get there. Let's say I only do 600,000. Uh, I will not feel like a failure. That's a whole lot more than 5,000. And so goals provide momentum and direction to move in. And so maybe you write down 50 cities you want to visit before you die and you only get to 38 of them. Who cares? You visited 38 cities you wouldn't have visited otherwise. Yeah. So uh, be willing to dream big. And, um, you know, when I first put down that I wanted to travel around the world, I got a passport. I got a clock back then. Now you do it on your phone. It tells you all the time zones. And I got a business card that said international consultant. And since that time, I've been to 51 countries that other people paid for me to come and speak. And it started immediately after that. I got invited to Australia. Then I got invited to New Zealand and Africa. So um, just trust that it's possible. Dream big. It's awesome. Uh, Jack. My last question is, is this, um, thank you so much, uh, 
for everything that you've imparted on the on the on the uh, on the chat to date. Um, very well. Uh, if today was your last day, Jack, and I gave you a piece of paper and a pen, and you had one piece of advice that you could give future generations to believe in their inner greatness, to believe in themselves. What's the one thing that you would write on that piece of paper? Well, I'd write a couple of sentences. The first one would be, you have to believe that you have everything you need to do anything you want. In other words, you're never given a desire or a goal or a want or a vision that you don't have the capacity to achieve. Now, you may have to learn some new things. You may have to go get some credentials you don't have. It may take you a few years. You may have to partner up with some other people. You may have to invest some time and effort and study and so forth. But there's nothing you can't learn to do. We now know that people that can't carry a tune can actually learn to carry a tune. We watch people on this TV show called Dancing with the Stars who can't move for save their life in the beginning, actually end up almost winning the competitions. Uh, people that think they can't write, writing best-selling books. I got a, a C minus in freshman composition in college, and now I'm a best-selling author. So uh, just believe in yourself. You know, you are a divine being that can be tapped into universal source energy and download anything you need in terms of inner resources to achieve any goal and make a difference in the world. Do not die with your music in you. That would be a sad, sad thing. It would, it would so be a sad thing. Jack, thank you so much. I, I, your book was so helpful to get me out of dark times. It, it's helped me, you know, I've been invited to speak on international stages next year in front of a thousand people. And just on so the list goes on and on. And, and I think the biggest credit of the book is this conversation. You know, I've, I've managed to, to get you on and, and hopefully this inspires people. I'm going to, I'm going to put all the books that we mentioned in the show notes, because I think if people can, can love themselves more, if they can overcome their, you know, their, their disempowering habits, if they can follow the success principles and read other inspiring stories, mm -hmm. I, I think we're really going to shift um, consciousness of, I hope, hundreds of millions of lives. So, uh, um, Jack, uh, I just wanted to put it over to you. Uh, is there anything sort of before we end the show that you'd like to impart with the listeners? Any last wisdom or... Well, let me, let, me just, let me just say this. The Success Principles is the American version of the book. In England, they published it as the subtitle. It's a red book, which says how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Yep. There's 28 principles instead of 57. So if, if that's what you find in the bookstore or what you can get on you know, Amazon.uk or whatever, uh, that's, that book is the same book, basically. It's just not as many. And then also, I would simply say, if you are inspired to want to learn these principles, the best way is to teach them. And you can go to jackkinfield.com and find out about our Train the Trainer program both online and live, we would do it both ways. I would love to have more people all around the world uh, listening to you and in the UK, especially where you are uh, as trainers of this. It's an opportunity to make a difference, to increase your income and to find a way to actually live a more purposeful life. So thank you for listening. I feel honored that you're all out there and I feel blessed that I can be of service to you. Jack Canfield, um, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're a great guy. Keep up the good work. I really appreciate you.